Quem é Besouro Suco? Nunca diga esse nome, ouviu? Besouro Suco. Eu tô falando muito sério. Se disser o nome dele três vezes, coisas ruins vão acontecer. Tipo o quê? Besouro Suco. Besouro Suco. Besouro Suco. <risos> o suco tá soltinho. Em 5 de setembro. Vamos embora com isso? A espera... Partiu, novinha. Acabou. Queremos agradecer a presença de todos nessa ocasião especial. Eu senti bem aqui. Eco. Garanta seu ingresso. Verifique a classificação indicativa. You are listening to Wednesday Wonders on the Mutual Audio Network. Be amazed. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. As I climbed out the window and jumped down to street level, I started putting pieces together in my head. Most likely scenario, the Kyrian spent the week making inquiries about where he could sell a valuable item, maybe even flashing it to show how valuable it was. Of course, he was in the wrong quarter for fencing something stolen that was that valuable, but he'd have no way of knowing that. All he had done was alert the locals to come slit his throat and take his valuables. Amateur. I knew the slash marks on the neck and who does work like that. And more importantly, where his circle is, in what part of town, and where he holds up. Bors the Butcher wants to make a name for himself, and so he has a signature slashing move that he does when he makes a kill. It's like saying, Bors the Butcher was here. Stupid. If you want to be a known assassin, you become known for not being known, if that makes any sense. But some people like Boars can't stand other people getting credit for their own sloppy work. I say sloppy. An assassin with real class would have smothered the poor sap in his sleep and not leave a mark. Make people think it was a natural condition that killed him, that he just died in his sleep. Well, Boris the Butcher is taking the shortcut to a hired killer's fame, and he may gain reputation or work in the short term, but it really hurts the long game. I assume Boris was hired, that he didn't do the tracking down himself, that someone gave him some coin to retrieve an item and kill whoever has it. Funny, sounds almost like what I've been hired to do. Who knows what it will come to? But I had a small window of opportunity to track down Bors before he made delivery on his ill-gotten gain. He didn't operate out of the Rivergate quarter, so he's going to be a bit slow getting back to his own place unseen. He's not too subtle either, so he may take more back streets while he's carrying his valuable. Bors has a little place he lives and works out of behind the leather worker, and I think he also does a little bit to keep thieves away from the shop too. It's a back room with nothing much else but a place for bed and slop pot. It was quite easy to access, and now upon reflection, I wished he'd secured his place a little better. I found him in a heap in his little place. He looked grotesquely thin, like someone had siphoned all the insides out of him. His skin was taut against his bones, his eyes hollowed, and he gulped for air like a fish out of water. Bors, what happened to you? Dark. Dark thing, he gasped, all wrapped in black cloth strips. Who hired you to take it, Bors? Bors? Its eyes, its eyes, whispered. And that was all I got out of Bors. A quick look around verified he didn't have the statue. But now I was at a dead end. Dead. I needed some more background and hopefully my paymaster followed my instructions and stayed put instead of going off looking on his own. I made my way back to the Howling Banshee with a number of questions in my head that were just out of reach. Sometimes instead of looking for answers, you need to look for questions, and there were a couple of important ones that were teasing me to find them. Until I did, I was stuck with missing pieces to this puzzle. I found the owner, Jessamy, and asked her if someone got a room with recommendation. Oh yes, she said. I'll get you your fee for that. Just put that on my tab here. I'll drink it later. Which room is he in? 
Third floor, second room, she said. Thanks, I nodded and headed out up to the third floor. I came up to the door and was about to knock with my fist hovering right over the wood when I thought better of it. I put my ear to the door and listened in, trying to ignore the sounds of the common room wafting up from the stairway. I heard water dripping into a bowl, probably washing down himself. That's fortunate. He'll be distracted. I drew out my dagger and slowly pushed in on the door. The sliding latch that secures the door can be accessed with just the smallest of cracks and the thinnest of blades. I don't go by the name Stiletto for nothing. I juked the door and slid my blade up, and the door came silently free. I pushed the door open slightly and peered inside. My client was standing in the water bowl and dipping a sponge in the pitcher and was sponging himself down, not a stitch on. I almost closed the door back up, but then I noticed a tattoo on his shoulder that changed everything. I burst into the room. Just stand there, I said, brandishing my dagger. Don't move a muscle. I pointed at various muscles not to move with the tip of my steel. For a moment, his hands were confused with what to do, either reach for his own blade on the table where the pitcher was, or cover himself in modesty. He went for modesty first. A priest wouldn't hesitate to cover himself first, I said, moving quickly over and grabbing his curved blade. But then again, you're not a priest, are you? Not with that tattoo on your shoulder. His expression, his whole demeanor changed upon the mention of his tattoo. He even gave up the modesty and shrugged with his hands spread out. You're with a fellowship? He made a sign with his hand, not holding the sponge. I didn't quite recognize it, but I countersigned. Things would have gone a lot easier if you just would have started out with that instead of the whole priest's disguise. Though kudos to your act. You're skilled. May I? No, you may not dress now. Keep standing there. It's rather cold, he said sulkily. I can tell. Now, let's start with the real story. You're the robber. You were pursuing him. Yes. He was the real priest, wasn't he? Yes. You were just pretending to be one. Why? As a priest, I could let in my band, and they could loot the place, and I could show where they kept the valuables. And none of those poor priests knew that tattoo you were was your allegiance to your band and the criminal union. This one got away while you were pillaging the temple. Yes. And killing the priests. Yes. And it was your job to chase him down. He paused a moment. They said I was sloppy to let him get away with the biggest prize, the image of San the Revered. He did not touch his cheek this time, saying the name. He was keeping it for the temple from falling into bandits' hands. Yes. He was quite devout and cunning to track. I nearly lost him twice. Almost missed him going across the river. The city is a good place to hide, and there's no large city around except for this one. For all the good it did him. Hiding in a city is a completely different skill, one that he lacked. You found him? Oh, I found him, all right. Dead, but warm. His killer close by? Close enough. I tracked him to his place, but when I found him, he wrinkled his brow. He must have been reading my face as I searched to describe what I saw. He was cold, but not yet dead. He looked emaciated, his eyes sunken in, breath shallow and gasping. Odd, he said. Poison? How about whispering eyes? What? This startled him. The last thing he said to me, something wrapped in black shroud and something about whispering eyes. He went pale. He began to shake, and even though I threatened both weapons at him, his eyes were wide and far away. Shadow ghoul, he whispered. He stepped out of the water bowl and sat on the bed. What is that, I asked. Protectors of the temple. They are supposed to be only legends, something to scare off robbers. You told me that there was a curse on the statue. That was just to keep you from stealing it yourself. Well, it looks like you were unintentionally speaking the truth. I wonder, he said slowly. I wonder if the other treasures have guardians as well. <laughs> you might not have a gang to return to when you go back. His head snapped out of its dazed reverie to me. You're, 
You're not going to kill me? Kill you? Not worth it. I went over to his travel sack and began rummaging around until I found a small bag containing a certain bejeweled item. That might be protected as well, he said quickly. You'd be dead if it did, I said. Now this, I held up the bag, pays for my time and trouble and for your life. I put his curved knife back on the table. Pre-dawn is coming. You should probably book a boat and get yourself across the river before sundown this day. If the fellowship of this town finds out you've been operating in their territory without paying homage, you'll have more to worry about than temple guardians. Words to be wise by. Know your territory before you work it. May I dress now? Do as you wish. I'm done here. I treated myself to a fine meat and wine dinner. I earned it. You've been listening to part two of The Temple Statue, a Dungeons and Damsels fireside adventure by Unchained Productions, written by David Ian. Voice talent by Laura Myers. Sound engineering by Dino D'Elfwell. Sound design by David Ian. Theme by Ron Perovich. Music by Mark Rose. The Temple Statue is a fireside adventure short story of the Dungeons and Damsels series by Unchained Productions. <laughs>